Hello, hello. It's the Japan Zoomina from UC San Diego. It is March 5th, 2024 in California in the afternoon, which makes it March 6th in Japan. Ohayou gozaimasu. Uh, I'm Ulrike Kashida, Professor and Director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology here at UC San Diego. And this event finds you at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We have, uh, as you can see here, over 40 faculty and 400 students, and we're offering, if you count them all, eight degrees, uh, and the largest of them is a Master's of International Affairs that you can earn with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our program offerings, please visit us at gps.ucsd.edu. And JFIT, Japan, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology, is our Japan center here. We have a lot of fun. Uh, you can follow us on the various social media uh, for activities and events. Today's event, like all of our events, is recorded. And that has uh, two implications. One, uh, feel free to type any questions you might have into the Q&A box as we go. When I uh, read out your question, I will refer to you only by your first name to make sure that your privacy is uh, maintained. And uh, the, the, the good news is that we have a library called the Jay-Z Gallery, Jay-Z as in Japan Zumina. And you can find links to past events at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zumina. Our upcoming events, of course, today we are talking about unlocking Japan's potential, and I will introduce our speaker momentarily. But mark your calendar. In two weeks from now, I have uh, Albert Chu with me here, who is um, at the digital lab of Sampo, and we'll talk about the future of insurance, followed by Tim Romero, who some of you might know from Disrupting Japan, uh, who is a recently turned venture capitalist, and we'll talk about his experience uh, and, and funding startups. Uh, and on April 30th, uh, I will have my former student, Oishi-san, join me because, and uh, here's a little thing on my on my own, uh, if I may plug, my new book is out. Um, it just landed in my mailbox yesterday. So it'll be uh, for sale on Friday, but it's only in Japanese so far. All right, so today uh, we're gonna talk about Japan's, uh, unlocking Japan's potential and Professor Dr. Peter Gross is here with me. And uh, I, I brought this picture, Peter, I see you have it in your background, but let me just show a few pictures so that people know what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and what it means for, well, science research uh, in Japan. And I think that's all I have. So Peter, let me bring you on here with me. Hello, good morning to uh, Okinawa. Good morning from Okinawa. And uh, I'm Wonderful very to happy you. to join you, Ulrike, for this uh, exciting event. Thank you very much. So let me introduce you. Uh, I'm sure the audience is like curious to hear um, uh, what, how how one of German's most famous developmental biologists ended up in Okinawa. Um, and so uh, Peter Grust uh, uh, was born in, in, in Hessen and earned his first degree. Uh, he stayed in Hessen for a long time, actually, mm -hmm. uh, in microbiology from the TU Darmstadt at the Institute of Microbiology. He then earned his PhD uh, at the Institute for Virus Research at the DKFZ Heidelberg, which is uh, Germany's Cancer Research Center. Uh, he did a postdoc at, um, at the Cancer Institute of the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, that was on tumor viruses and oncoviruses, I guess. Uh, became a professor at the University of Heidelberg at the Institute of Microbiology and uh, uh, with a specialty in molecular biology, which, by the way, is something that UC San Diego is, of course, uh, very strong at, if I understand Absolutely. correctly. Absolutely. Um, and then um, you moved to the Department of Molecular Cell Biology in, at Göttingen. And um, the, I'm cutting short a long period of being a professor in Germany where you had over 500 publications. Um, at the end of all of this, or or maybe it's building up to um, um, Peter Gruss becoming the president of the Max Planck Society in Germany. And while he was doing that, he became known uh, for his calls for more funding. Um, and uh, I cite Peter uh, to compete with the Harvards, the Cambridges, and the ETG Zurichs, um, or ETH Zurichs. Um, you pushed for financial 
financial freedom for research institutes from the German university system. I think that's a topic that uh, applies to OIST as well. And I want to hear what you have to say about that. And I'll end my introduction um, uh, by noting that you have so many prizes that if I were to read them all, I would fill up the hour. There's the Leibniz Prize, which is the German NSF equivalent, the DFG uh, Prize. There's a Louis uh, Jante Prize in Medicine, the German Future Prize, the um, Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, which is a huge thing. And uh, uh, most recently, the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star from Japan. And as we just uh, talked, Peter, if you were to put them all uh, on you, you'd look like uh, you'd kill over or look like a Christmas tree, maybe. <laughs> um, so how does Okinawa fit into all of this? Um, OIST is the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, as we'll learn momentarily. My understanding is it was founded in 2005 with a significant investment by the Japanese government of $2 billion at the time give or take, whatever that was. Um, Peter became the, uh, not only professor, but the president of OIST in 2016 and uh, retired in 2022. Uh, and Peter, I understand you're still a member of the Japan Academy, so one of the leading researchers in Japan. And thank you for everything you've done, not only for the German scientific community, but also for the Japanese one. So thank you and, and, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you again, Ulrike, for having me, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, let's, uh, without further ado, uh, get going, because what I will do, and that may surprise you, uh, is something that has nothing to do with my original education as a molecular geneticist. Instead, what I would like to do is to discuss with you, after having been now seven years in Japan, my personal perspective about uh, how science and technology uh, can lead to innovation within Japan and what is necessary. I think we all know that uh, embracing innovation is essential for countries looking to thrive and adapt to the ever-changing business landscape on a global scale. So I believe if Japan wants to stay competitive in the years to come, this is the major issue that needs to be addressed. So let's take a look at the current situation. Uh, this is what we all know, and it's uh, probably not a surprise. I know uh, Ulrike is an economist. Uh, many of you may deal with the economy. So um, you see that Japan's growth rate has been declining. But more recently, this seems to be even more prominent because uh, just about uh, a month ago, uh, we noted that Japan has ceded its spot as the world's third largest economy to Germany. And I can tell you that at this point of time, Germany is not doing too well. Nevertheless, uh, uh, Japan ceded the spot and is now the fourth one, um, uh, um, um, sliding into an unexpected uh, recession. Um, Japan will have the lowest real gross domestic product per capita among all, all major economies in 2060. These are government numbers or predictions. I, I know they will probably never happen or hopefully they will not happen uh, because of the low productivity and the declining population. And uh, further down here on that slide, you see that in 2023, the number of births is historically the lowest ever since Japan began compiling statistic in statistics in 1899. Now look at the innovation uh, capacity or ability. Uh, in 2022, uh, the Global Innovation uh, Index published uh, that Japan is ranked number 13 out of 47 higher income countries. And that means that already three countries uh, from Asia have been moving ahead and bypassed Japan as the most innovative country. Now, um, 
I'll give you a few examples what's happening. Oh, and these, of course, are you know, uh, individual um, um, examples. They may not be true for the entire industry, but they give you a good view as to what's happening currently. We, we know that uh, Japan was one of the major car exporters uh, in the world. But now look, China overtook Japan as the world's biggest vehicle exporter last year. Furthermore, Tesla's uh, Model Y is the best-selling car in 2023, and an e-car, mind you. Uh, and uh, the Tesla uh, Model Y replaces the decades-long leader, uh, Toyota Corolla. And Akio Toyoda, the chairman of the Toyota Motor Corporation said in a recent talk he gave, somewhere along the way, we became a company that prioritizes volume and profits, a company that makes money, not cars. Indicating that, at least I interpret it this way, there is a lack of innovation. So McKinsey uh, came up with the following statements, Japan's industrial R&D departments are no longer achieving world beating performance. At the macro level, the country has slipped in global rankings for productivity growth and intellectual property generation, even as the total R&D expenditure remains high. I come back to that. We have to take that statement with a grain of salt. And at the micro level, our research reveals that R&D leaders in Japan have lost confidence in the ability of their organizations to meet the challenges they face. Now, what's the international competition? Why do we need to focus on innovation? Well, this is a statement uh, by Xi Jinping uh, who uh, clearly states that uh, um, innovation is the most important fighting ground of the international strategic goal. So not only is it a business issue, it is a political issue that we have to be concerned about. So the key question then is, how can Japan strengthen its innovative power? considering what I just said is, uh, is a fact. And I have something here that uh, is um, a general scheme as to how within countries a innovation network is structured. This one happened to be from the United Kingdom, but I can tell you in principle terms, those elements, are represented in every country. You see some arrows here that uh, reflect the talent flow in blue, in red, the financial flow, which I'm not going to address in detail, and the technology or knowledge flow. So let's uh, briefly take a look at the large companies. Uh, the large companies here, I compare the Chinese Huawei, Siemens, Roche from Switzerland with Toyota. And you can see that many other, many of these countries actually spend more uh, for R&D than Toyota, for example. As I said, this is uh, taken out. Uh, it is a, a particular company. Others may be different, uh, but it shows that uh, um, Japanese companies are not better, at least, than the other major companies around the globe. Now, what is the general principle of innovation? And I hope uh, the experts uh, among you forgive me, but I have just taken up two different types of innovation. One is the incremental innovation, and the incremental innovation is uh, improving existing products, is following the market pull, represents a low risk to industry, offers calculable but limited gains, and earns a monopoly for some time, in general terms, brief time, 
they are mainly generated in industry or applied research. In contrast, uh, the breakthrough innovations create new projects. They are driven by new technology. And here, clearly, uh, the United States is the leader. Israel is also not bad. Uh, represent high risk to industry, may offer high long-term gains, generalizable utilization across multiple sectors, and are mainly generated in, I wouldn't call it uh, basic research, I would call it publicly funded research. So uh, where is that know-how from publicly funded research, uh, for, uh, where is that generated? First of all, let's take a look of the competitiveness in R&D at the university level. And this is what you can see here. Uh, you can see at the level of the top 1% most quoted papers. As a matter of fact, the top 10% is almost identical. So you can see that the mature world leading research universities are literally all in uh, the United States. Some of them are in the UK. We have then in the middle level, internationally competitive research universities like OIST. I included RIKEN uh, because RIKEN is, a, is not formally speaking a university, but they also accept students and uh, their level of uh, research performance is actually quite good. But you can see at the end of this line, uh, then the Japanese universities, the leading Japanese universities, uh, Tokyo and Kyoto universities uh, are, are coming up. Then we take a look at the publication record through the course of time from 2000, literally until now. Highly cited papers here, it's also about the top 10%. Uh, and you can see that in around 2000, Japan was number four in the ranking of highly cited papers. In roughly 2010, Japan is number six. And by now, Japan is number 12. So over the course of 24 years, Japan has uh, gradually lost competitiveness, lost excellency in the production of highly valued research. This is the result. Uh, if you look at the bluish reddish type of bars that uh, point downwards, you can see that in fields that are highly critical for innovative products like physics, like chemistry, like material science, like engineering, like biochemistry, like uh, computer science, like immunology. In all these fields, Japan has lost competitiveness in the past 10 to 15 years. Why? And let's see what the, what the competition does in contrast. Look at the Chinese uh, performance, and this is uh, really has been published about uh, two or three weeks ago. China exhibits a meteoric rise to become the most prolific nation for natural science publication, as determined by the Nature Index. Of the top 100 fastest rising institutions, between 2017 and 2022, just one, and that happened to be a German university, Technical University of Munich, is outside of China. You have to you know, consider what that means. It means there's a huge investment in the Chinese universities, and this investment is yielding results namely applications in the highest valued journals. So now let's look again what the, the current, and this is actually from yesterday. 
Uh, when you look at that, uh, the new policy from China, Xi Jinping is trying to move away from debt fueled sectors like property and move towards strategically important industries. The terms it uses are high quality development and new productive forces, which includes uh, uh, and here the latest measure, sorry, the sentence is not quite complete. The latest measures to achieve that is uh, that the government would increase spending for science and technology research by 10%. This is an enormous number. Uh, so Chinese is investing even more now in the years to come into their R&D base. And that's something that uh, is one of my favorite slides. It's a bit on, on the old side, but what it shows is uh, the result of an analysis of all patents written in the United States in a period of 10 years. And it deals with the references. So when you analyze the references in these patents, you can see that almost three quarters of the scientific references originate from publicly funded science institutions. And down you can see a most highly cited paper is nine times more likely to be referenced in patents than randomly chosen paper. And the authors conclude Governments hoping that the research they fund will foster innovation should therefore emphasize research excellence. When mediocre research is supported, neither science nor innovation is likely to gain much direct benefit. Now take a look at then what, what kind of um, organizations are publicly funding research and here, you see uh, one of the, uh, say, breakthrough products uh, that Apple has come up with, uh, the first generation of the iPod, and subsequently the first generation of the iPhone. And uh, you can see that all of them are being, all the important patents have been generated by publicly funded organization like CERN, like DARPA, so the, even the uh, US uh, 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 military research arm, uh, Department of Energy, uh, NIH, NSF, uh, Department of Defense, uh, and so forth. So bottom line is, there is a whole lot of publicly funded organizations worldwide, specifically in the United States. And all it takes is someone like Stephen Jobs who puts together those patents in his mind in order to generate a product that uh, um, will revolutionize the market. So, what is the R&D funding situation in Japan? And this is something that Japan normally is showing and it's very proud of because you can see here that the overall GDP for R&D spending, uh, Japan is number four. Um, but you also should take a look at what the government fraction is. So the public part that funds, if you wish, research in institutions, in universities, and here in green, this one here, is Japan. And you can see that we are almost 0.5%, while Germany, in the meantime, is about 1%. So the bottom line is that the fraction of research that is funded by the public, by governments and the likes is extremely low compared to competitors. So here I summarize what I just showed. While Japan's spending on research and development as a share of GDP is among the world's highest, 
the government's budget for science and technology has essentially remained flat since 2001. So more than 20 years, there was no increase in funding the publicly funded research in Japan. Meanwhile, other leading research nations such as Germany, South Korea, and China have significantly increased their spending. So there has been a recent development in Japan, uh, and uh, this development uh, is the setting up of a 10 trillion yen university endowment fund. Uh, and the question is, can the injection of the 10 trillion yen uh, endowment fund that has been launched last year, help Japanese universities produce world-leading research. It is an add-on, but as Japan currently is below the OECD average in R&D spending, it will not reach the OECD mean. I think you get up one notch, uh, but it will not, significantly change uh, the position of the uh, Japanese sciences, science funding on a world level. Furthermore, as you can see here, at least for this year, Japan's 10 trillion, 70 billion university endowment fund is off to a rough start, posting a deficit of 60.4 billion yen about 420 million US for its first full fiscal year, which ended in March. So you can also note, saying this, that the administration of the finances is obviously not anywhere near uh, the administration of the endowment funds that are available in the United States. Now the consequences then will be seen very uh, at, at the application side. Let's take a look at the venture capital in our scheme. Now the venture capital of Japan is very low and uh, you can see here that it's far behind most competitors. Uh, and on that slide, you see only 3% of the capital raised in the US, 15% in Europe is uh, available in Japan. The average deal size is low, uh, limited funding for early stage startups and a lot of corporate venture capital. And that of course is venture capital that primarily does not flow into startups with new products. It flows into products that are of importance for the companies, for the corporate uh, 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 company. However, and this is what you see, this is literally then what's happening because the entrepreneurs bring innovation products uh, forward. Uh, so an economy is benefiting from, uh, from entrepreneurs. And you see here the share of entrepreneurs versus economic growth, Japan at the lower half of the scale. And in consequence, not a surprise, I think, which you will see now, that Japan in the higher income economies, this is the red box on the right, is the last in that group and uh, is not doing very well in terms of uh, providing the conditions for entrepreneurs to go forward with a startup. This is the recent um, development in Japan uh, up to 2021. You can see that although the total deal value goes up, so probably there's some late stage funding. Uh, what you also see is that the overall number of startups is actually going down. Not a surprise to me at least, but given the image that Japan wants to transmit across the globe. It is a surprise that you have here 
for, by looking at the uh, uh, unicorns, Japan at a very low place. You can see here that country-wise share of world's total unicorn startups, uh, Japan is doing very poorly at a global scale, which if you take to heart what I just said, low productivity of science, of a science space, low level of venture capital, resulting in something that is not competitive in terms of uh, uh, unicorns, so the high, highest valued uh, startup companies. So let me then summarize uh, what I said. What do I think uh, is necessary in the years to come? Well, as number one I have here, enhancing research and development funding. Uh, we can uh, discuss this also, uh, fostering startups and small and medium enterprises. Uh, we need to uh, take care of regulatory hurdles that are also different in many of our um, 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 areas in Japan of the prefectures, tax incentives. Uh, there should be uh, maybe a one-to-one -one funding uh, government versus private VC capital. There should be more incubators and accelerators. We need to strengthen university industry collaboration there are a few universities like Tokyo, like uh, Keio, uh, like Kyoto, they do fairly well, but most universities uh, don't even have a technology. I, I am talking about national universities. They don't even have a technology transfer unit. We need to improve IP and regulatory frameworks so uh, the protection, it should be easier for the Japanese uh, universities to uh, secure IP. Um, we definitely need to invest in human cap capital. Um, as I showed you at the beginning, uh, by means of the low birth rate, it is highly necessary to bring in foreign talent, but foreign talent mostly speaks English. So the universities have to switch gear, at least after bachelor, they have to teach in English. Companies, at least the international companies, have to conduct their discussions in English. So these are all, uh, let's say, means that need to be addressed in the years to come. Promoting international cooperation, well, I think that would be an, uh, an addition uh, if you have a lot of global international collaboration, the talent is uh, aware of what's happening in Japan and may consider moving to Japan. Creating an innovation culture, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and learning from failure uh, instead of uh, going for the secure jobs. And this particular point has to be addressed literally from elementary school onwards. Focusing on sustainable innovation, I think we all know that we have a lot of uh, uh, worldwide uh, challenges like climate change uh, and Japan is one of the worst in terms of CO2 productivity. So uh, there's a lot of room for improvement to come out with green technology within Japan. Digital transformation, uh, you know, there are companies that are completely digitalized, but not many of the uh, Japan's traditional industries in the manufacturing business uh, are yet there. So one needs to improve the digital transformation. Um, and we need to have uh, the continuity and coordination. Uh, so among the different ministries, among the different prefectures, we need to make sure that there is a coordination so that people know what they can expect, even if they move within Japan. So implementing these steps requires a concerted effort from both the public and private sectors, as well as a commitment to long-term vision and policies that adapt to the evolving global technological landscape. Japan has a strong foundation in technology and education, 
combined with a strategic investment uh, in innovation that can improve its position in a, uh, as a global leader in innovation or rather get back to leadership in the uh, innovation area. So looking at the elements that I showed you and walked you through, it is essential literally that Japan needs to meet the challenges along the entire innovation value chain. Unfortunately, it's not just one area. These are areas that are interconnected and have to be addressed in a concerted effort. Well, that was it. And thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. That's that's great. Let's see whether we can stop the share. So that, yeah, there you are. Great. So um, so super. Thank you. Um, the sobering summary of the situation. I was uh, quietly thinking, well, well, whether Germany is so much better. So so I have two main questions for you before I bring the audience in. Uh, one is in fact the the German Japan comparison, and the other is is about. Um, your, your background photo uh, and OIST. So, um, so let's maybe start with the German Japan thing and then and then go into what's actually happening. So, um, a friend of mine, uh, my good colleague, uh, once uh, said, not not even jokingly, that at the time of the Meiji Restoration, Japan had a choice uh, to go either become like MIT or become like Heidelberg. Yes. So it's understandable if you look back, you know, in the late 19th century that they chose Heidelberg. But uh, but listening to you, I, 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 I had this impression that a lot of what ails Japan is that it is still, the universities are still operating as if they were Heidelberg in the 19th century. century. Right. I think and, this is a fair statement. And um, if I would look at uh, uh, the United States and, uh, and the 19th century, there is uh, actually the most successful university in terms of uh, output, uh, um, you know, paper for, for money uh, is the Rockefeller. Yeah. Rockefeller has also been modeled after Heidelberg. So <laughs> it, uh, what I'm saying is it depends what you do, what you make out of it. But, uh, you know, um, uh, it, uh, at, at face value, the Japanese university system is kind of stuck in the early post-war, Second World War, post-war Germany. And uh, you, you know, coming from this country as I am, um, you know that we had quite a revolution in the six, late 60s, 68. And uh, this revolution has triggered a major change in the German university system. Now, nevertheless, the German policy is not focusing on elite only. The German university system, which as you know, is for free is providing everybody with a option to get a good university education, even at the cost that the general ranking of German universities, while better than in Japan, is not as high as it is, for example, in the, in the Ivy League schools in the United States. So uh, this, by the way, and now I'm uh, switching to OIST, has been recognized by the founding fathers. There were two intellectually founding fathers of OIST behind me. Uh, this was a very visionary politician, Koji Omi, and then at that time, Minister of Finance, and uh, Sidney Brenner, uh, the molecular geneticist, and uh, these two have looked at the landscape and have decided not to attempt to change an existing university, but rather have a university built up from scratch. And the model they have uh, oriented themselves on was Caltech with 300 PIs which I believe is still the best model. And within only one year, 10 years, you can see here 
uh, behind me, the OIS 10, because uh, we have been two years ago celebrating uh, the first decade of OIS. But OIS has, if you look at the overall productivity per PI, OIS is in the top 10 in the United States uh, worldwide and number one in Japan. So the basic concept, putting an emphasis on a excellence only with at that time, the first 10 years, I would say 90, 95% of stable funding. I call it high trust funding uh, from the Japanese government, despite the fact this, so it's government money, but we are legally speaking a private university. So it has been recognized. Uh, OIST has delivered. The question now will be, does Japan, the, uh, the, uh, the educational system, make use of that model? And at this point, I have my doubts because the government has decided to roll over the budget until 2026. So OIST currently is not growing. OIST has to increase third party income. And that also makes it again, completely different from the Max Planck Society. And if I might say so, uh, the Max Planck Society, given its small size, is the most successful uh, um, organization um, producing high level research. Uh, I would even dare to compare it with the Bell Laboratories because in its existence, we now have 37 Nobel Prizes and Nobel Prize laureates, not that we're students, they work at Max Planck. So, so I was just going to go there because I think that's the biggest, and, so, and my friends kind of half joking, the choice between MIT and Heidelberg, what, what's left out of that equation is that, that even though Germany has the free public universities and whatnot, the Germany has always had these research institutes. Exactly. And it's exactly. not just Max Planck, there's also no. Fraunhofer. Yes, we, so have, we have uh, basically, it's a, it's a, a research organizational system. Right. And we can, uh, you can criticize it, but the bottom line is Max Planck is the producer of uh, top research information. Fraunhofer is the top applied organization. And the president of uh, Fraunhofer has, has once said, uh, when someone wanted to join Fraunhofer in a discussion, well, if you want to make get a Nobel Prize, go to Max Planck. You are not right here. So Fraunhofer is the application. And then we have uh, the large research arm of the government is called Helmholtz Organization. So you have accelerators, you have the cancer research, you have a, a whole zoo of things that hide under this umbrella. So that's how they structured it. And that produces, if I'm not mistaken, already one third of the total output of sciences in Germany. So then that begs the question, would that be something that Japan could copy? I mean, the- Well, the, it has, the, this... it, you know, to, to be honest, it has copied it. Uh, and uh, there is one organization that is called RECAN. So Riken has been, uh, you know, the predecessor of uh, Max Planck has been Kaiser Wilhelm Society. And then they changed structure and name after the Second World War. But Riken was founded uh, according to the model of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society 11 or 12 years after the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. So what's the difference now between my current Max Planck and Riken? Riken, unfortunately, is dependent only on the central government funding. Mm. The Max Planck is dependent on all states and the government with the consequence that no one can tell Max Planck what type of research to do. So Riken, as the Japanese universities, I just was in a, in a reviews uh, um, a meeting of, from Riken, since 2001, Riken has not increased its budget. While Max Planck has every year either 5% increase or 3% increase. 
which documents the dedication and determination of the German uh, um, um, government to invest in high, um, um, high output uh, science, high output uh, organizations. So that's, that's what I think is the difference. And unless Japan shapes up, they are going to lose out further. Yeah. And I see a tremendous, a tremendous need uh, in Japan to address these various issues. So our uh, mutual friend Ravi has a very interesting question on this German-Japan uh, uh, comparison. Uh, as a good American, uh, he wonders how these research institutes, let, let's stay with Max Planck, um, get interaction between researchers and students. So why, how, are, how is this not, how are these not just ivory towers where, yeah, yeah, where yeah, a yeah. handful of people kind of talk to each other and right, have lunch? Right. So how do they stay fresh, I guess, right. is this question. So, uh, um, uh, Robbie, this is a very um, easy way to answer that. Um, First of all, the government deliberately didn't want uh, Max Planck, Fraunhofer, or Helmholtz to get the accreditation as a university with a consequence because the Max Planck Institutes are embedded in the larger university environment that literally every Max Planck research director, we, we call a departmental head a research director, Every Max Planck research director is at the same time an honorary professor at the local university. With this function, it is the person that gets the student from the local university and can literally give the degrees through the local uh, university, not through Max Planck. But obviously, the research is all being done in, in Max Planck. And uh, I think this combination is actually quite successful. And a lot of students uh, actually come to the Max Planck Institutes in order to graduate there, like I said, through the head of the department, who at the same time is a professor at the university. So we have, um, we have two questions uh, that are Japan specific. And um, they're dear to my heart, so I want to bring him into this conversation. So we have a list of 10 things that Japan needs to do to be successful. And um, at, and, and, and those are all, all great. Uh, but the questions that we have are, isn't, isn't there a deeper challenge to Japan's lack of breakthrough innovation? Um, one being rooted in, in the risk avoidance. Yes. Uh, so David wants to know what can be done to... Uh, you know, um, uh, make make people less risk versus how 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 can this be changed for the future generations? And the second question is about leadership experience and skills. That mm -hmm. I mean, is has Japan been too entrenched in its own system? And and with the English and whatnot, you mentioned all of that. Right, right. right. Um, and 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 so and, and so I'd add to this: what are the mechanisms at OIST to overcome these uh, two? deeply ingrained challenges. Right. So let me start from the end, because that's easier and less complex. <laughs> okay. At OIST, it is very clear that everyone, including administration, for everyone, the working language is English. Uh, we have, like I said, high trust funding. So there is a stable element that is highly attractive to the Max Planck people and OIST people alike. And that led in the past decade uh, to the recruitment of 65% of the professors that are non-Japanese. 80% of the students are non-Japanese. So you can see this behind me is a very good environment to demonstrate what it takes to internationalize Japan. And now we are coming to the more complex question. Because what, what, what you're seeing here behind me, this is really the platform that can produce the findings that then can be translated through accelerator and incubator 
into monetary value uh, in, in form of a startup. So you need to train actually people in what you address specifically. And I have no, you know, I, I have no, uh, uh, you know, um, solution except for saying it has to be addressed from the primary school, elementary school onwards. These people have to not learn by heart the facts. They can get them out of Google. They need to learn being creative. So throughout the school, one would have to establish a curriculum that encourages young students to come up with creative ideas. Like I'm sure in the United States schools do this, in Germany schools do this. So from this point of view, it is a process. And that's why I'm saying it's very complex that has to start in school. You need to do, and this is what we do at OIST, to also educate the scientists in this area of economy, how to write a business plan, how to secure IP. So while this is not part of the curriculum that we put up forward in an examination, it is crucial to have an add on information. How can I do this? in a context like this. And uh, I believe that Japan, and this is like a glimpse of hope I have, is slowly changing from the lifelong employment at a big company to also trying to do something new. But as you said, a risk avoidance is, 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 uh, is uh, prevalent. Uh, you have to accept if you fail once, that this failure makes you more valuable for the next type of uh, a startup because you learn from your mistake. It'll be a long way down the road. And I believe without government uh, support in both science and venture capital to encourage more venture capital to flow into the country, this is not gonna happen. So we're going to have Tim Romero tell us that more venture capital is flowing into the country. I mean, in, yes. and if you start at a low level, you know, and you know, you can grow 100% really fast. But but it's it's going the right direction. I also understand there's a school reform going on as well as university admission systems are being reformed. So so things are changing. Mm -hmm. They're changing right. slowly. Um, so you had one chart where you showed the iPod and how much of some of these technologies were actually funded by DARPA and, uh, yes, and so, yes. so on. And uh, Dan has a question, which uh, which goes to this demand that the, the government uh, uh, as a as the buyer of technology or as a financier of technology and asking for it, let's go to the moon, you know, and develop oh. semiconductors, that sort of thing. Exactly. So Dan wonders whether a massive expansion in defense spending in Japan might solve some of the problems that you're talking about. Is it, do do you do you think that that it's possible that that the government, rather than just giving money uh, to universities and say you know do more research, if the government were to buy more research, explicitly say what it wants, would would that change the way Japanese universities think about? setting up there it's a, it's an interesting idea let me answer uh, let me answer that in in two ways the one issue for japanese universities is that they do not get early enough uh, independency and i always advocated uh, what the united states has but, uh, for example uh, in uh, uh, the nih funding or in the uh, howard Hughes funding that you get full packages as young scientists or the EU, which is called ERC, European Research Council. You get five years, everything, full package. And you can pick your place where you want to go. So Japan needs a bottom-up driven process that revolutionizes the top-down hierarchy. And you can only, as far as I'm concerned, do this with a uh, uh, bottom-up funding and give this to the young, bright people. Now I come back to what Dan uh, indicated. It's an interesting idea to buy research. Uh, it would mean that you would have to ally with uh, companies uh, that are cutting edge 
and that uh, this cutting edge uh, research, uh, you know, let's say DARPA, for example, uh, this cutting edge research, obviously, and in many cases, has produced valuable goods. And uh, these valuable goods uh, can be incorporated then in something that is uh, important for the entire society. Uh, and that's why I, I showed the iPod, because it still needs a genius like Steve Jobs to put together. I mean, have you seen the individual elements that this guy Yeah, but the, the together, idea right? is that, you know, we got Teflon out of astronaut yes. suits, right? And so- yes, um, exactly, so the, exactly. That's it, let's, exactly. Let's go to the moon. Actually, uh, on, on that on that point, so, so maybe that would be a way for Japan to go if they were entrepreneurs. Um, our colleague Dietmar asks um, whether we need to rethink maybe how we've been thinking about startups. And, and I'll just read his question. Uh, we now see a lot of research close to the basic end of the spectrum being undertaken by startups. So fusion, quantum, AI, there's a lots of startups, uh, including yes. in Japan, that are doing some deep tech the serious yes. deep tech uh, um, you know, uh, innovation. So are some forms of basic R&D so successful that they can be financed privately from the start and do we maybe need to adjust our models of science and transfer uh, as this is happening? Because we, we used to think that basic and deep tech comes out of the, the big uh, funded institution that you call trust money institution. Mm -hmm. Is that still true is, or is the, is the in, innovation environment changing so that private players might become more and more important actors in this? Well, um... There may be some, and this is, of course, the, the famous uh, $100,000 question uh, that you pick if, if you are good. Uh, you pick the ones that can function very immediately and uh, also yield within the first five years. Secondly, however, if particularly you look in fields like quantum, like fusion, my personal view is without a very sound platform of basic research results, these companies cannot do it. They need to utilize again what the public domain has to offer in patents and IP, and then come up with a famous idea like Stephen Jobs to do something like a laser-driven fusion reactor. Uh, well, again, I mean, you, you, you need to know that in, in this case, uh, there is a hell of a lot of energy flowing in and very, very little energy coming out in that type of uh, company. Um, so what am I saying? I'm saying that uh, stepwise, uh, having an accelerator within a uh, university that brings it to the attention of the venture capital is a good thing to do. Um, it's a good thing to do. So the accelerator should be paid for by government. And from then onwards, what we need is a better marketplace. And uh, one could talk and think about uh, non-fungible tokens. One could point, think about having a IP patent pool because most of the IP from universities are not being used. Why? They are not known to the experts. Yeah. So you need a marketplace and that marketplace. And then here, Dietmar, I think, here we get together, that marketplace could be drawn upon and have something then that can be uh, can be transformed into something useful uh, as a product. With, and, and Dan is saying the government could start that marketplace by, yes. by asking yeah. for now these things. I, I'm, so, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, that's super interesting. Unfortunately, yeah. time is up. And uh, the Japan Zoominar is known for not going over time because people have to run to work. In fact, we see that's happening now. So let me uh, round it up here. And thank you, uh, Peter Gruss from Okinawa. Thank you so very much for joining us. It was a really fantastic conversation. And I could go on for another hour, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. Hopefully, we'll get you back sometime or um, I'll maybe I'll come and visit you in Okinawa. And Do audience... So. Um, uh, we'll be back in two weeks talking about um, the changing role of insurance companies in an aging society uh, and how the digital transformation may open up new 
venues for how to think about aging, longevity, and insurance. So see you then. And until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you very much. Thanks for your